You're watching the sermon of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's sermon is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. You take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5 here this morning. Romans 2, 1 through 5. For a, a, a long time now, what has been known as the most quoted verse of the Bible among unbelievers has been Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Matter of fact, in his commentary, his commentary in the Pillar Commentary Series, D.A. Carson, he wrote back in 1991, he said, In an age when Matthew 7.1 has displaced John 3.16 as the only verse in the Bible that man in the street is likely to know. And there, there's more to that quote, but I'm going to hold that off to the until a little later. Why is this the case, though? Why is this such a well-known verse? So much so, as Dr. Carson says here, that the knowledge of this verse has exceeded the knowledge of John 3.16 among unbelievers. And he said that over 30 years ago. 91 was 32 years ago, going from 33. <laughs> But he said it over 30 years ago, and yet his statement is almost just as, if not more, true today. Why? Why is that the case? Because this is the defense of anyone who would seek to silence any moral absolute that stands against their own sin. One wants to justify themselves in their sin in order to continue in their sin. Now, though, we, we have to ask of that verse, is that a valid understanding of the verse? That I can use it to deflect any judgment against a lifestyle that I'm living. And therefore, it would call for there to be no judgment at all on anything. Is that what Jesus is calling for? To, to never make any kind of judgment at all? No, that would be to twist the scriptures, right? I do like Paul Washer's response to this when someone says, judge not lest ye be judged, and his response is, twist not scripture lest ye be like Satan. Uh, and he's right, because that's, that's what it is. It's a twisting of scripture. And how do we know? Again, how do we know anything? How do we know what anything means? We look to its context, context, context. Context. And so as we, if we were to keep reading there in Matthew 7, we would see just five verses later, Jesus calls for judgment to be made in verse 6. He says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. And so what's he getting at there? Now, out of respect for what is holy... Specifically, as to we, we give the gospel out to others. As we give the gospel and, and others respond to it with hostility, it's not that we're just to keep trying and keep giving the gospel as if, you know, if we just do it enough or we just explain it well enough, we'll, we'll get them saved. No, we need to realize we can't save anybody. God is the only one who saves. We're the instruments of getting the, the message out, but God saves. And so when the gospel message is met with hostility, uh, we don't keep giving then that, that those, hostile, those hostile ones, we don't keep giving them the opportunity to disrespect the gospel or to make a mockery of the gospel. Or two, if someone refuses to humble themselves under the law of God and so confess that they are not a good person but a sinner under God's judgment, if they will not humble themselves under the law in such a way, then really there's no gospel for them anyway as well. And so we have to discern, we have to judge, so that we do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw 
pearls before pigs. Also, if Jesus was teaching never to judge, if that's what Matthew 7, 1 meant, then Jesus would be contradicting his own words as we read them in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 24. When Jesus said, do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. And really, that's what's at stake. Are we judging with right judgment? Or is there something else that's twisting our judgment and, and, and distorting our judgment? And we'll, get, we'll look more at Matthew 7 a bit later. But the rest of that D.A. Carson quote, he says, It is perhaps worth adding that Matthew 7, 1 forbids judgmentalism, not moral discernment. And, and that really is the point. It's not that we're not to be discerning. It's not that we're not to judge, but it's that we're not to be judgmental. And judgmentalism, by which a sinner justifies themselves by looking down on others for their sin, that's what Jesus is getting at there in Matthew 7. I mean, we can even keep going into verse 3 and see what Jesus says as he talks about uh, trying to remove the speck from your brother's eye, all the while you have a log sticking out of your eye. Right? And what does he say? First remove the log from your eye so that you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so this, this judgmentalism is what's in view. And well, Scott, what, what does this have to do with Romans? Well, it's that same judgmentalism that's in view here in Romans chapter 2 as well. And so as we, we turn to this passage here, Romans 2 verses 1 through 5, we remember that la the last two weeks Ken and I have covered in chapter 1 verses 24 through 32, where... What is said is the wrath of God, there in verse 18, the wrath of God that is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, where we see what that wrath is in those verses, in that context. And it is the giving up of mankind, or the turning over of mankind, to the outcome of their rebellion against God. And they're suppressing the truth about God, the truth that God has revealed about himself in creation, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness, in the embracing of their sin. And that leads to idolatry. Uh, that's the condition of all mankind by nature, including you and I. And this giving up, in this, God actively consigns mankind over to the enslavement of our sin and the propensity of our depravity. And so we see then, as mankind rejected the knowledge of God in their sin, and so exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and other creatures, we read there in verse 24, therefore, or you could say, for this reason, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity. And so there we see that wrath revealed as God gave them up. And we discuss there, as we work through that passage, that we see there that God gave them over to all kinds of sexual impurity. And then as we kept going, we see Paul says that man exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And then verse 26 says, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And as we went through that passage there in the continuing verses, we saw that God had turned mankind over to unnatural desires of, of homosexuality, those lusts and, and actions. And then as Ken went over last week, that continued the downward, downward spiral into depravity, as we read in verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And then there in verses 29 through 31, you have this list, Paul's longest list of vices. And then verse 32 said, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And so again, remember, in all of this, Paul is showing that all mankind, both Jews and Gentiles, are under sin and therefore have no righteousness of them of their own, 
and are therefore subjects of God's wrath. And specifically there in chapter 1, Paul is pointing out how the Gentiles are under sin and have no righteousness and are deserving of God's wrath. So then as we continue on here, we come into chapter 2 and Paul is making a transition. He's transitioning from showing that the Gentiles are without righteousness and so therefore need the righteousness that's revealed in the gospel, the righteousness that's from God. And now he... It transitions to show that the Jews also are without righteousness and so need that righteousness that's revealed in the gospel. And as we come then to chapter 2, there's some debate on how this transition is made. Uh, There are some who argue that right from chapter 2, verse 1, all the way through chapter 3, verse 8, Paul is addressing the Jews. Some argue that Paul here, at the start of chapter 2, is still addressing just the Gentiles but religious or morally proud Gentiles. While others argue that Paul here in his transition from talking about the Gentiles to talking about the Jews, transitioning, he's here talking about both Gentiles and Jews. And I'm up for being shown that I'm wrong in this, Uh, So I I do hold this with a loose fist. (laughs) Uh, But I would argue that in this transition, Paul is referring to both Gentiles and Jews. And you'll see him later refer and talk about both Gentiles and Jews too before he gets to chapter 2, verse 17, when he is specifically addressing the Jews. And so then, as we see this transition, let's, let's read this passage together. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgments will be revealed." So, as we see this section, Paul here, he's using a style of teaching that was known as um, uh, diatribe. And in this, Paul is imagining an opponent who stands against his teaching. And this style of teaching is seen in different ancient writers. It's also seen in Uh, other portions of the New Testament. You see it in the book of James, for instance, and and we'll see it moving through Romans more as well. And so as we start this section, we see once again, Paul begins with the word therefore, or you could say for this reason. And so Paul is drawing a logical conclusion from what he was talking about in chapter 1, namely that the Gentiles are without righteousness and under the wrath of God. And all the evidence that he gave for that. And so drawing a conclusion from this, Paul says that the one who would look at what he condemns there in verses 18 through 32 of chapter 1, uh, the one who would look at the fact that the Gentiles are under God's wrath and therefore would say, yeah, they should be, go get them. That's right, those dirty, disgusting Gentiles all those who practice all those things. They're wretched sinners. They are, as opposed to the one saying this. Paul is addressing that kind of person here. Such a person who is a moralist. And this moralist can be the religious Gentile or a Jewish person with the law of God, knowing God's standard. And so in this, Paul draws a conclusion from everything he said in chapter 1 
Saying then that those who would cheer on the destruction and the wrath against the Gentiles because of all of their, their sin and the ways they live, that person is without excuse. And when he says here, you have no excuse, we see here he uses the second person singular, you, you are without excuse. And that shows that he's not addressing his readers, most of which whom he didn't know. And if he were addressing the readers, it would be more likely that he'd use the second person plural, not singular. And so instead, he is addressing this imaginary opponent, the one whom he addresses as, oh man. This imaginary opponent, again, is, is either a Jew who would judge the Gentiles for their immorality or a Gentile who thought that they had a greater moral standard and so looked down on the wickedness of Gentile society. And just in case there's any mistake of who Paul is talking about here, he says that the man is every one of you who judges. And so what we see is this imaginary opponent is a moralist. He's a moralist. He's one who judges others, whether a Jew or Gentile, he judges others, and so himself is without excuse, because as he looks down on the moral bankruptcy of others, he, he thinks himself to be morally superior. When in truth, the basis by which he passes judgment on others could be used against him, finding him just as morally bankrupt. So Paul says, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. And how can Paul say that? How can Paul say you who judge others and practice the same things? I mean, it could be that this person in public condemns certain actions in hypocrisy while he in private does those same things. It's possible. But more likely what Paul is addressing it is one who points to others and their actions that aren't like theirs, that I don't do that thing. And so therefore they see themselves as morally superior. When all the while, really categorically, they, they are the same. And so for instance, if we were to look at Matthew chapter 5, we see the teachers in Jesus' day, the teachers of Israel, they, they lowered the standard of God's law in order to justify themselves and their sin. In order to be able to claim righteousness of their own. And so Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 goes through the, uh, those commandments and the law and he brings correction to their teaching. And so for instance, we see him correct the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And so the thought was that as long as I did not actually or actively cheat on my wife, it didn't matter what my thought life was like, it didn't matter what my desires were, but if I didn't actually do it, then I could not be charged with adultery. I, I could not be charged with being sexually immoral. And so such a one could look at what Paul said in chapter 1 about the Gentiles' impurity and say, see, I'm glad I'm not like those Gentiles who do all kinds of perverted things. But Jesus takes that away. And I would argue Paul here in Romans 2 also takes that away. Why? What did Jesus say about this? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 28, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So basically, you who look down on that guy because of his sexual immorality, the truth of the matter is, you're sexually immoral as well. You can't say, well, I would never do that, and therefore ignore your own sin. Just because there's someone you judge as worse than you doesn't mean that you are really any better. And so what we see here is a kind of judgment 
that allows me to gloss over my sin, to ignore my sin, since I'm not like those reprobates over there. But categorically, I am. I'm really no different. We all are. Because which of the Ten Commandments has any one of us kept perfectly? None. We're all guilty. If I think the murderer on the news is wretched and deserving of God's wrath, well, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 22, if I've been unjustly angry, if I've been bitter with rage, I'm guilty of having the seeds of murder in my own heart. And where do you think those murderous actions of that guy in the news, where do you think that all came from? Where do you think it started? With the seeds of murder in his heart. And we've discussed when we stand before God to give an account of our lives, we're not just going to give an account for our outward actions, but God's going to judge the condition of our hearts because he's that holy, he's that good. And I am guilty of murder in my heart. And yet there I am on my high horse, looking down on the guy in the news, failing to see if he should be judged by God, so should I. And so really I show that I have no excuse. Because clearly I know God's standard, and yet I break it. And so what is Paul, what Paul is getting at here is not that we're never to judge in any way, or, or to make any kind of judge. That's not what he's saying. As a matter of fact, Paul here is saying the same thing that Jesus says in Matthew 7. When Jesus said, judge not, that you be not judged, he's talking about judgmental judgment, uh, self-righteous judgment. And we see that as Jesus continues on and gives the reason for why he says that in verse 2. He says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so we should be careful about the kind of judgment we would pass. Again, hypocritical judgment that is inconsistent towards one's own behavior. So that which is self-righteous judgment, that's what's in view in both passages. So the man who judges the sexually immoral or the man who judges the murderer or whoever judges, I don't know, whatever sin you and I may think is more heinous than our own sin, really, we just affirm God's right to judge us. Again, some people say, then that means you can't judge, because if you're just as guilty, then you can't judge anyone else in their guilt. Well, no, no that, again, that's not, that's not what he's saying. It's not saying we're not to be morally discerning. The Bible is clear, we are. It's not saying that we're not to uphold God's standard. We are. But what we are not to judge in order to justify ourselves or to make ourselves feel morally superior. That's what we're not to do. We're not to judge to ignore our own sin and forget about our own deserving of wrath. We see here in Romans 2, verse 2, Paul says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. And with this word, no, Paul makes clear that he's referring to something that is obvious, that is self-evident, that is something everyone knows. Paul knew, the Jews and Gentiles that he was writing to, they knew. The self-righteous Jews and Gentiles, they knew as well. And you and I know. God's judgments are, as, as it literally says in the Greek, 
which is, is brought out very clearly in the New King James Version. God's judgments are according to truth. Not according to any kind of favoritism, nor any kind of bias or arbitrary discrimination. Nor are God's judgments based on what things seem to be or how they appear. No, God's judgments are based on what is. His judgments are according to truth. And so therefore, his judgments are always right. And rightly falls on those who practice such things that violate his holy standard. And we see in what Ken went over last week that the Gentiles, in their depravity, they too know this. They know God's judgments are according to truth. We read there in chapter 1, verse 32, it said, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. They know God's judgments. They're aware. And they know those judgments are right and true. They know the truth, but they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. But all of this, it shows that there then is no way for anyone to stand before God apart from Christ and not stand in judgment. To not then face God's wrath. Since God judges according to the truth, and the truth is we have all violated God's holy law. We are all sinners before the holy God without any righteousness of our own. Again, that's the point of the section we're in, this larger section that goes all the way into chapter 3, verse 20. We're all under wrath. We all are without righteousness. We need that righteousness that's revealed in the gospel, that righteousness from God. You can't hope to be right before God and escape his judgment and escape the wrath because you find yourself to be more righteous than somebody else. That's not how it works. None of us are righteous. God's judgment will bring that to light. And so we have to stop comparing ourselves to others. Stop looking down our noses at others that we deem more wicked than ourselves. Because the truth is, in indicting others, we condemn ourselves. But see, that's exactly what the moralist does. Even though he is just as guilty, having categorically committed the same sins, he thinks that since there are those whom he deems worse than himself, there are those who he sees as disgusting, they're the bad people, and since he's not like them, he's actually good. And that's how people think. I mean, uh, you don't have to share the gospel very often to come across someone who's going to say, no, I'm a good person. Why? Well, I'm, I'm no Hitler. Right? See, he tells himself God won't judge him because he thinks he's good. And so Paul says to the moralist there in verse 3, Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And yeah, that's what the moralist thinks. But he knows the truth is God's judgments are according to truth. That those who practice such things that violate God's law will face his wrath. And so if you are guilty of what you yourself condemn, then you need to realize you too should be condemned. To think otherwise is just to deny the truth. To be inconsistent with your own judgment. And so let me ask, do you really think, if you're depending on your own goodness, if you're depending on being not as bad as somebody else, do you really think you shouldn't be judged? Do you really think that that makes you good? Well, it's the other people that are bad. The moralist thinks that he can stand before God and be accepted by God in of himself himself. 
you know, as opposed to that guy in the news. Or as opposed to his neighbor that practices despicable things. But he's just as wretched as well. And even so, if that's what we do, if we look at others, we have to realize that really the truth is that the guy in the news or your neighbor or your coworker or that guy you went to school with or, or whoever, again, Hitler, even if, even if you were just a little better than Hitler, even if that were true, Hitler's not the standard. Your neighbor's not the standard. The guy in the news is not the standard. If we were to say, listen, to, to get into heaven, we all need to be able to jump really high. Whoever can jump the highest, they're the ones who will get into heaven. And how do I compare to someone who's less athletic than I am? How do I compare to, I don't know, I would assume Michael Jordan was. He's in his 60s, 70s, right? I'm sure he can still jump higher than me. Uh, but even in his heyday, I've been. So am I going to compare myself? There's always someone that's really, that's going to be able to say they're better, right? But when the standard is how close we jump to the moon, whether I compare myself to a child who can't jump very high, or I compare myself to Michael Jordan, any of those comparisons are, are ridiculous when we look. The standard is, is the height of the moon. Comparing ourselves to others is ridiculous when the standard is the standard of God's own holiness himself. That's the standard. That's the comparison. I'm not looking to see who I'm better than. I'm looking to see how do I compare to God. That's the standard by which I'll be judged by. So how do I compare to God? How do you compare to God? That's the standard, and the standard God has revealed in his own holy law, in which he shows his holiness. That's the standard that matters. But you and I, who are trusting in Christ, we're not moralists, right? I mean, we recognize that we're sinners. We recognize we need a Savior. That we have run to Jesus by faith as the refuge from the wrath we know we deserve. Now, we still have a tendency to be a moralist. We still have a tendency to be self-righteous. Maybe we're not trusting in our self-righteousness for our salvation, but we still have a tendency to look down our noses at others and say, at least I'm not like that guy. Though we are trusting in Christ to save us, though we know he took the wrath we deserve on himself on the cross, though we're trusting in his righteousness for our salvation, you know, this is all true, brothers and sisters. We're not beyond being the moralist. Trying to exalt ourselves by our own self-righteous judgment towards others. You know, maybe as we even read Paul talk about the moralist here in this text, we think, yeah, I know a guy like that. <laughs> he thinks he's holier than thou. Man, he's the worst. Man, I can't, I can't stand that guy. He's so awful. And so we're implying, I'm not like him. I would never do that. I would never say such things. All the while we show we have the same self-righteousness as the moralist. Or we too, we see the guy in the news, or anyone else in, in what we would consider disgusting depravity. I mean, look at that guy as if there's no hope for him, there should be no hope for him, he should just be taken out back and dealt with as a dog with rabies. He's not someone I would want to be around. Would I, would I even share the gospel with him if I had the chance? We judge him as if the same propensity of the same evil does not reside in us naturally as well. 
we fail to recognize the only reason we have not done the things that others have done in our estimate is not because of any goodness found in us, but because of the grace of God restraining sin in us. And so again, we see what we've said since the start of this section in chapter 1, verse 18. That we have to realize the truth is that there's really no more wickedness and evil out there, out in the world, than there is right here in my own heart by nature. Or in your own heart. Again, that doesn't mean we do not judge anything as evil or wrong. That doesn't mean we don't uphold God's standard as we preach the gospel and call others to repentance and faith as we have been called to repentance and faith. But it does mean we don't exalt ourselves in our own eyes as if we're better than anyone. Because we think our sins aren't as bad or we haven't done that thing, whatever it is. The truth is, in of myself, apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ, I am a wretched sinner through and through. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, there is no aspect of me that sin does not affect. I am totally depraved. Apart from the work of God, there is no hope for me. It's just as we sung before. In the song... There is a fountain, right? And the reference to the thief on the cross who starts out by cursing Jesus with his friend but then recognizes who Jesus is, recognizing he's innocent, that he is the king and says, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And we sang, where there may I, there at the cross, may I, though vile as he, I'm, I'm just as wicked as he is. Though vile as he Wash all my sins away. I am the chief of sinners. There is no one who deserves wrath if I don't deserve wrath. And I do. But that's the beauty of the gospel. That's what's so incredible and so amazing about what Jesus has done for us. Uh, That's what we often don't understand. We don't get the depths of our sinfulness, and so we don't appreciate the gospel as we should. Because we don't understand the, the depths of what Jesus has done. When I am the chief of sinners, and yet God chose me, not because of anything about me, but because of everything about him. He chose me. He drew me to Christ that by his power I may wash all my sins away. That's the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. If my sins can be washed away, if I can be saved, There is no one who can't be saved. There is no one who is too sinful, for we serve a mighty Savior. He saves all who come to him in repentance and faith. So therefore, it is only in Christ that we can be saved. Only by faith in him. My friends, God's judgment will fall. And if one is trying to be good in of themselves, if they're trying to exalt themselves as as not as bad as someone else, really, they're still just as guilty, and they will not escape his judgment. And then Paul, in verse 4, he furthers his argument to the moralist. The moralist who supposes he will escape God's judgment. And he asked, or, or do you presume, or, or you could translate it as, do you despise, do you, do you hold in contempt, do you look down on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? In other words, are you using God's grace as a license for sin? Is it that since you're not in hell yet, you don't think you'll ever be there? 
Well, that's foolish. We see here God's kindness, his forbearance and patience. We see here they're all, they're all rich. They're all in abundance of wealth towards the sinner who is not yet in hell. For hell is what the sinner truly deserves. And yet it's only the riches of kindness and generosity of God that God in his common grace would continue to give the sinner breath and keep his heart beating and sustain him with food and give him all that he needs for life. And even very often beyond that, not just giving what he needs for life, but giving him things to enjoy in life. And then in the richness of his forbearance, God tolerates the sinner who continues in rebellion against him who is his creator, who is the sinner's king and Lord. We see the the riches of God's patience, God bearing up under, holding back his wrath, waiting until the day that he has set for when he will let his patience run out. Until then, his patience endures, richly. See, too often, my patience runs out. It's not because I've determined it should run out. But when my patience runs out, it just shows that I really lack self-control. And when my patience runs out, it's tipped off by my own selfish desires. God, on the other hand, When his patience runs out, it's because he has determined for his patience to run out. And he has determined. The the calendar is marked. The day is set that on that day, his patience will last no longer. He's determined. That is the day when he will exact perfect justice. So as the reprobate continues in their sin whether the Jew with God's law, knowing God's standard, or the Gentile with an innate knowledge of God, though he suppresses it, as each continues in their sin, refusing to repent, they despise all the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience. They show contempt for all of these things, for all of God's grace. For as long as they experience such grace, they disrespect God. They do not honor him. And so in their persistent rebellion, they're basically asking God to cause his judgment to fall on them. For all the wealth of kindness God has shown, and yet they're ignorant of the fact that God's kindness was meant to lead them to repentance, lead them to the turning of their minds and the turning of their hearts and their lives and their whole being in conversion, turning from sin to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's this very goodness of God, this wealth of kindness that God uses as part of his means to draw sinners to himself to be saved. It's what he uses to awaken the sinner dead in their sin to the truth of who he is so that the sinner can repent and believe. If I recognize how kind God has been towards me, if I see the depths of grace and how he has tolerated me in my rebellion, how he's been so patient with me, how can I continue in sin against him? How do I continue to do what is displeasing to him and offensive to him when I see how good and kind he's been to me? I can't. I can't without despising the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience. And so think too, brothers and sisters. Think of how you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, as those who have been shown more kindness than we could ever grasp, those of us who have been chosen by God and been shown such immeasurable grace and mercy, those for whom Christ has died and settled God's wrath against us. What kindness of God do we know? And yet, would we ever choose our sin? Would we ever find ourselves deliberately sinning and therefore despising God's kindness and grace towards us? May it never be. And yet, 
none of us can say that it hasn't been. Brothers and sisters, we must never, ever think we have become something in ourselves. We must never think that we're better than the moralist. How much more, when we choose our sin, do we despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? We do. The truth is, we're not examples of the goodness of humanity. But the fact that we stand here as saved by the grace of God, we are examples of the abundance and great extent of God's grace to save a wretch like me. And so by that grace, let us see that God has been so incomprehensibly kind to us. And so by his grace, let us sh show then the power of that grace and the impact of that grace on a wretch like me that, that by his grace I would be converted. That he would make it so I'm no longer who I used to be. That there's true repentance. Let us show it by continuing to repent bearing the fruit of repentance in our lives. By his grace, let us work out our salvation, as Paul says in Philippians, with fear and trembling, as he works in us, causing us to will and to act. It's by his grace. Let us rejoice with such kindness. Let us see what love with which he has loved us and love him all the more. To put away our sin, to kill it, not so we can pat ourselves on the back, but so we can say, Lord, I love you and I want to live for you. And as we find ourselves falling short, let us rest in his promises. The truth that we know that our salvation is not dependent on us. And so we can rest in what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ saved to sin no more, right? What hope is that? I'm so frustrated with my sin here because it displeases the God who's been so good to me. The day is coming when I will sin no more. Our salvation, it is secure, not in anything of ourselves, but in everything about Jesus and all he is and all that he has done. Having been so kind and so loving, let us love him in return and seek to please him with all of our lives and all that we do. So then in verse 5, again, the, Paul addressing the moralist. And we see there the moralist is dead in his sin. And due to their hardened, or you could say stubborn heart, Instead of repenting, they are storing up wrath against themselves. Instead of repenting in view of God's kindness, they continue in, in storing up wrath. The heart of the reprobate is hard, is, is unresponsive, is callous towards any spiritual prodding. And just because God's wrath has not fallen yet, no one should think that it will not fall. So the moralists should not think that they will escape God's judgment. Instead, the longer they go despising God's kindness, the longer they go without repenting, all the more wrath they continue to store up against themselves. They will not escape. He who knows God's requirements as he judges others, all the while he's just as guilty, he will not escape. And the wrath of God will be poured out on the day of wrath, in the day that God has set for his patience to run out. That's the day of wrath. And Paul also calls it the day of the revelation of God's righteous judgment, or as the ESV says, God's righteous judgment will be revealed. It will be clear on that day that God's judgment is just in all the judgment he renders. And we'll begin to see some of that next week. But on that day of wrath, it will be clear, God's wrath is just, even for the moralist. And so my friends, if you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ, 
If you're banking on your own goodness to be saved, I plead with you, repent of that. It's not true. There's no goodness in any one of us. Turn to Jesus Christ. He has been good for you. You have no righteousness in yourself. Turn to Jesus Christ to be saved. And you will be saved. And for those of us who are trusting in Christ, that we recognize there is no hope in us apart from him. We must depend on his righteousness. He has taken our wrath on himself so that no ounce of it would ever fall to us. He has given us new life to live. And so let us live that life in response to what love and kindness he has shown to us. Let us not despise the riches of his kindness and grace, but let us live in response, living because of all that he is and all that he has done. Let us give our lives to glorify our great and awesome God, our mighty Savior, who saved even a wretch like you. Let's pray. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnbbc.com.